What's my point? What's my purpose? What are we looking at here? Why in the world am I walking you through all these things? Let's answer this question. Has God called you as a Christian? Yes or no? Yes. Has He called you to be a very directional light? Has He called you to be a, a, a light used for only high voltages? Has He called you to be a light that takes a while to warm up? Has He called you to be the newest and the greatest in LED technology? What is He what has he called you to? I can't answer that question. That's not something that I can call you to. Because you see, just like I do on a regular basis, I go into businesses, I go into homes, go into facilities all over the area. And I walk in and I say, okay, in this area, what you really need is because I understand it. I have a knowledge of this stuff. It's unbelievably boring to most people. But I do. So on my email, if you've ever got an email from me, my tagline is the lighting nerd. <laughs> no one wants to know this stuff. But it's needed. Just the same. Sometimes we need to call out to God. Say, God, I don't know that I'm feeling my I don't know that I'm reaching my intended purpose. Maybe I am this spotlight where you've called me to be a, a light that reaches out to the sides of those around me. Maybe I'm only being a Christian on Sunday mornings in service. And I'm looking in thinking I'm so bright. But when others stand around me, they don't even see me. What are we called to? What's our purpose? The call of God is threefold. Let's look at these. One, he's called us to repentance. In 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us for not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Mark 2, 17. He said, When Jesus heard it, he said unto them, They that are whole have no need of a physician. If you're healthy, we don't need to run to the ER. Jared's been doing a lot of work in the ER. And there's some people that run into the ER that you just want to tell them, Good cry, go home, put a band-aid on it. Be all right. He says in Mark 2, 17, those that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinner to repentance. When the disciples preached, they preached repentance. Repentance is basically forgiveness. Okay? Okay? Let's not make it too churchy, okay? We don't want to, to talk over people here. This, let's keep this just what it's intended to be. Come to me. Say you're sorry. Don't do it again. It's repentance. That's all it is. So have we been called to God to be repentant? Yes, we have. First John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to what? Good, you're still with me. Forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God has promised in his word that if we only confess our sins and repent, he'll cleanse us. Once we confess, once we ask him for forgiveness, what happens to those sins? They are cast into the sea of forgetfulness. Now, I don't know about you, but I am glad that God does not bring up past sins. You know, with me on that one? The sad thing is, 
We don't have God for that. We have fellow Christians that do that. I mean, really. When we pray for somebody and they, they work through a struggle and a time of sin, and we see them come to repentance, and we see them one night out, maybe late at night, we see them somewhere, and our, our minds automatically go, oh, that they fell, they're probably drinking again. And then we call somebody, oh, we need to pray for so-and-so, they're probably out drinking again. And all of a sudden, we become the instrument that reminds people of their sin. Not God. <coughs> God has forgotten those and cast them under the sea of forgetfulness. You see, there's three things God cannot do. God cannot lie. He can't. He cannot be tempted with evil. It says in James 1.13, Let no man say when he's tempted that I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither can he tempt any man. And three, God simply cannot remember your past sin. It's important for us to recognize that when we come to God in repentance, He has completely forgiven us and He has cast those sins away. They don't need to be with us anymore. Are you thankful for that? Say amen if you are. Number two, He's called us to dedication. If you're not wearing your steel toe boots this morning, you should have worn them. Alright? We as Christians tend to be dedicated to our jobs, to our spouses, to our kids, to our homes, and even to our churches. To a point. We get to a place where we show dedication each and every day in different parts of our lives. But the biggest dedication that we need to make is the de dedication that we give Sunday morning, say, from 9 to 12.30. Oh, I'll be dedicated as long as I can be comfortable. i tell you what, Pastor Todd, you know, I'm, I'm really dedicated to the Lord. As a matter of fact, I'm so dedicated that if they need me to, I'll, I'll pick up something after church. You know, like someone needs to maybe put hymn books back or something. I'll do that, but, if, but really only if I can be done by 1230 because, you know, I have other places to be. But I'll be that dedicated. Hmm. I thought about this. We were seeing the, what do they call it? The prelim to the Daytona 500 of the little preliminary races they had yesterday. I'm not a huge NASCAR fan. Forgive me, I'm going to call. But I thought, are you, are you so dedicated to work that you skip work to go see the Daytona 500? And then I thought, well, yeah, probably some of us might do that, depending on our job. Would we skip church? for something like that. For a lot of people, the only time they go to church is when something goes wrong. As a matter of fact, they become righteous when they need something from God. We need to be fully dedicated. We need to be able to stop everything say, you know what? Is God number one in my life? Is he the very first, the very top priority for me? If so, that's where my dedication should be. It should be at the top. God deserves our total dedication. There are too many fence riders in churches today, too many Christians trying to play both sides. Too many of that saying, oh, how I love Jesus on Sunday." and go to work on Monday and act like they don't even know him. <clears throat> Jesus said in the book of Matthew, you can't serve two masters. You'll love one and hate the other. 
Let me propose this morning that it's really time to choose sides. It's time to decide if we're going to be fully dedicated to the cause of Christ. Or if we're just going to try to take it easy. In the book of Joshua, the Bible says, choose you this day, not tomorrow, not next week, but today, whom you'll serve. When it comes down to that type of dedication, this question pops into mind. I'll ask you this, and I'll let you think about this for a second. Are you a fan of Jesus, or are you a disciple of Jesus? Think about that. Are you a fan of Jesus or are you a disciple or a follower? Will you go with me to Luke 14? I want you to read this with me. We're going to look at this as we finish up. Luke 14. We're going to start in verse 25. I'm going to give you time. I want you to follow me. Some of you may see the, the salt that's still up here. You say, what's that for? We'll get there in a second. You may see this. What's that up there for? <laughs> Just for me. Luke 14. We're going to start 25 through 35. It says this. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Wait, what? What did he say? If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. <clears throat> so let me ask you again, are you a fan of Jesus or are you a disciple? When we come to this recognition of salvation through Jesus Christ, we're not promised an easy road. As a matter of fact, we've heard preachers say over and over and over again, it's not a better road, it's serving Jesus. Because we don't want people to get the wrong idea that it's just going to be, you know, gumballs and lollipops all the time. It's not. As a matter of fact, it goes to the other extreme. I've heard teenagers say, well, I'm I'm afraid if I really take a stand for Jesus at my school that my friends won't like me anymore. Maybe. I'm afraid that they'll make fun of me and ridicule me. It's very possible. I'm afraid that I'll end up alone. My may happen. Because being a disciple of Jesus requires a dedication that's different than being a fan of Jesus. I kind of get this image in my mind when the soldier goes into battle and the bullets start firing and the grenades start exploding and all of a sudden he comes running back into his commander's tent and he runs in and the commander goes, what is it? And he says, they're shooting at me. There's bombs and stuff. I want to go home. <laughs> I don't think so, man. Get out there. You sign 